Welcome back to the non survey Podcast. I'm still Lucy Steigerwald, and my internet studio guest today is Finn, also known as the Queer Armorer. They produce accessible and educational firearms content. They also run Rainbow Reload and H. I'm assuming that's New Hampshire. I haven't asked yep. yet. <laughs> the foundation chapter of a decentralized shooting group for queer folks and friends. They are a massive firearms nerd, which I've already seen a little bit of on YouTube, which is it's, it's interesting. Um, they are an NRA certified instructor, which I'm also going to ask about, and a passionate advocate for guns and community defense. So welcome to my internet. <laughs> Thank you. Hi there, everyone. We already had accidentally had a 20 minute conversation that would have made a great <laughs> podcast but now we're even more ready to do this thing i guess i would love to start with you describing your you know self-describe your politics and if you have any journey to get where you are today what that looked like oh well this is going to be a very lengthy journey so my apologies it's kind of a condensed version of a thing that i have been writing this into a book that is coming out in the near future so it's a story that is like very much in my fucking head so my apologies if this is too much of an info dump all right let's do let's give it a try in terms of politics i'm a systemic anarchist which means i am a big believer that all systems inherently corrupt and need resistance um i in terms of the journey to get there god i started out as uh, a privileged as fuck shit lib that was like very very i've had i've been anti-gun control entirely because well i i I want to have guns accessible for a long time but i haven't had a real like i don't know before when i was younger um my mom was a violent alcoholic so when you, you know when she's threatening suicide you call the cops they're the people who come and help and i'm white and privileged and come from a wealthy town so my view of what the police were was wildly tainted by my experiences growing up. Um, there was a period where I was an EMT and I, I fucking loved that. And uh, while I was working as an EMT, I was actively being uh, recruited by uh, lo- one of the local police stations. I was having a lot of d- talks with the captain, getting permission to to carry in New Jersey, which is like fucking gold. Oh, New Jersey. Sure. Yeah. yeah. If you don't have, essentially, if you don't have like special permission of a captain, you're not getting permission to fire mm-hmm. or you're not getting permission to carry rather like just basic owning one is going to be an impossibility for you. And, uh, uh, you know, he's like, you, you should absolutely join the police force. Uh, I am at this point, I'm getting access to these cop classes, this, all of this really awesome, like, you want to learn how to shoot a shotgun like a cop? Come learn defensively with us. We have these uh, the, these classes that you should be taking. Uh, you want to learn how to shoot a pistol? You absolutely should. You're going to need this in the future. Come learn with us. Take the cop classes with us. Um, content warning for uh, sexual assault. My apologies to anyone in your audience. I was an EMT. I'm in med school. Uh, I'm being actively recruited. I get assaulted while I am on campus and I, I'm identifying as a trans woman at this point. I go to the campus police thinking, okay, I was assaulted. I go to a cop. That's what you do. Uh, who the, the campus police are understanding until they look at my ID and they go, Oh, well, it's your fault for dressing that way. And they won't file any of the claims. I had been interacting a lot with my local police department and knew a bunch of the procedure and knew the state IA, uh, the state police IA office was uh, like, I knew exactly where it was. I knew how to go in and file and talk to somebody. And that's the better way to get a complaint heard. That's internal affairs. I yes. Think. Yeah. And I am in the office in Newark. Uh, I am, I, I said, I want to, I want to file a complaint uh, uh, against uh, an officer. Uh, They're like, is it a, so you're supposed to, there is a state police internal affairs that handles not just the state police, but also local police. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, there is a, there was a campus police officer. I understand their office exists under yours and your investigations are the ones that carry the most weight. This is what happened to me. And they're like, okay, um, hold on a second. Uh, I'm waiting 15, 20 minutes and I get a phone call from my captain on my cell phone. 
not quite explicitly telling me that uh, if I file the report that they're not going to be able to hire me because like they need the, the language I think he used was like, we need to make sure that we have team players or something like that, <laughs> which like I was just fucking assaulted. Your problem is me filing a complaint, not the, f- I, I it kind of broke me. Cause like I, I had been thinking about police as like, okay, some of these people aren't great, but some are legitimately thinking about police as the way they protect their community. And realizing that some of the people at the top didn't view anyone who was at all disruptive as part of their community, it it threw me for a while. I, I spent a few years bouncing between a couple different things. I tried launching a game studio at the exact wrong time, and then, uh, I was a street medic during a bunch of the protests during the COVID George Floyd thing. Um, While also doing a bunch of street medic stuff. And uh, from that, I I got a lung infection and I was, I have this tendency to do either. I am doing nothing but that thing. And I am focusing 130% of my energy on it, or I'm not really doing it well, if I'm doing it at all. And, uh, I was like, okay, I have been pounding and trying to head to do as much community medical care stuff as I can, and it has been killing me. I need to stop doing this. My EMS certification was about to lapse at that point. And I was like, I'm, I'm not getting recertified. Uh, I need to focus on stuff that I can actually build into a life. And uh, I spent a couple of years... Uh, I built the channel. I started shooting uh, just because I wanted to make educational content for other people. And also, well, I started the channel because I wanted to make educational content because a lot of the stuff that I was learning from would also include jokes that kind of felt like, fuck you for being queer. Um, Grand Thumb is a great example. I love his content. I absolutely adore his content in places. Some of the stuff where he goes over uh, his breaking videos where he not breaking the, his test videos where he does mud tests and snow tests are fantastic. His channel identity, every single video starts with shitting on my gender. Like he makes the helicopter joke as his fucking channel identity, Jesus which fucking Christ really. Right. And <laughs> it, it's kind of a thing that like, <sighs> I'm embarrassed for him, among other right. things. But at the same time, there also aren't necessarily great replacements for a lot of, if you want to learn, there's only been a, a few places that have good accessible content. And fire shooting is a complicated thing. There's knowing about the skill itself. There's knowing about the weapons. There's knowing about the laws. There's knowing about so many different topics. Like, you need to be educating yourself. And it felt like a lot of the content that exists is if it's not explicitly pro queer, it frequently has either vague or open queer bashing nonsense inside of it. And there isn't much, if any of the openly queer stuff. So I decided, fuck it. I'm making more of that. Also, uh, rainbow reload and the channel a little bit, uh, were very inspired by one of my early shooting experiences was trying to, I was shooting with uh, Maine's Socialist Rifle Association. Uh, my local has a bunch of problems, which is a whole other thing. And, or Southern Maine and SRA is the, the group I was shooting with. And they showed me this awesome spot. So I come back up to the same spot um, like two weeks after the the time that I have been, that we went there. And I'm out on my own. And it's like a, a, a public, it's, they call it the, they used to call it the pit. Unfortunately, it's no longer an accessible spot, but it used to be that anybody who wanted could go into this place and bring and shoot whatever guns you wanted. Um, there was no RSOs. There was no like safety controls. It's really just, you are liable for your own shit. Be careful. And RSOs, range you? safety officer. That's the people who like, make sure if you do something very, very stupid, that's the one who tells you, you don't get to shoot today. Um, And if you do something smaller on the level of problematic, they'll like, hey, don't point the gun in that direction. (laughs) Or, uh, no, that's not how you check to see if that's clear kind of thing. There's no RSOs at this place. It's just like everybody accepts your own liability. Mm -hmm. 
and I am practicing on my own when a group shows up and uh, we like, I, I say hi, go back to my own shooting and between like my resets while I'm changing mags or see, I keep hearing out of the corner of my ear, someone saying faggot. And I keep looking over and having them looking away and guns are controlled bombs. And I don't want to be practicing with mine around people who are fine with my corpse. So like, yeah, I ended up leaving and I had a moment of like, wow, it would have been fucking awesome. And it, it, it needs to be a thing that we can find a shooting space that either it is explicitly queer friendly or we go there as a group and make it queer friendly. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where Rainbow Reload came from. Well, I'm sure as hell sorry to hear some of that, but that's also a very interesting um, life journey. Sorry for the the info dump of life. No, lives. I mean that was that was compelling as I as I winced a couple of times. Um, so if we're talking the, the labeling, uh, systemic anarchist is where I would label myself. Coming from shit lib naive about <laughs> yeah. the police okay yes coming from like a vaguely shit lib is the term that i use for like people where like when you did say you know what i when, there's a version of a liberal where you have to use the same like vocalization that you would for like throat cancer where it's like <laughs> it's it, liberal like that's liberal <laughs> i don't mean that as a good thing <laughs> Do you have people and or, you know, books, media that that helped you on on this trip to where you are today? Like, ooh, a bunch um, at the moment, because I am a weird YouTuber and I have been absorbing a bunch of that. Um, Dan Olson from Folding Ideas. The, uh, H bomber guy mm -hmm. has yeah. a, a fantastic fucking uh, interestingly something that I have been I, I have watched a bunch recently because it not only makes uh, a great video the points that she makes very much expand into like where my thinking is um, philosophy tube is, uh, Abigail Thorne have put out of it has a video um, what is the law or how the cops make up the law. There we go. I guess I don't know her. I I know the, the other two. But... Uh, Philosophy Tube, I highly recommend. She is a trans woman who has a, got a philosophy degree in the UK and decided to, like, put it online for free. So she just makes videos about different uh, philosophical subjects. And um, she also, like, has a bunch of really great explorations about gender and... Uh, she transitioned on her channel and to the people who are who like have only tuned in in the past few years she jokes about how like oh yeah you know my, my brother who used to run the channel because people can't like connect the two <laughs> but I highly recommend her content and just way of thinking uh and in terms of i guess older writers because i there has been stuff that i have pointed to that has been like I don't know. My dad was really big into Thomas Solo when I was a kid, and oh, I, man. discovering I like dad like that, <laughs> yeah, and, and that was like pushed on me as a thing that I was supposed to read. But I was always like, I, I'll, I'll get around to this later, and I really fucking wish I had at the time because I would have realized, oh, we're not syncopatico. This is not like this is a oh, this is a base level issue where we just just it's not a yeah yeah. I think there are a lot of thinkers you can point to that have pieces that people glomp onto. And then you look at the rest of the body of work and it's like, oh, this is horrifying. Yeah, that's always the danger. And I'm always hesitant to point to any writer now because anybody that like, if I haven't read all of your work, I don't want to find out. I, I've accidentally been been agreeing or telling people to look into somebody who is it turns out their anarchy comes from anti-Semitism or it turns right, yeah. out their reaction to fascism was light all communists on fire. Like there's, there's yeah, I, I, I'm those people I sign off on cause they produce such a, a large body of content on a regular basis that like, if there is something hidden in there, it's hidden well, and I'm not referring to past work. I'm only talking about the stuff that I've seen and like interacted with recently. I'm, I'm not saying these are 
perfect human beings with the content they have made in the past few years has been fantastic in terms of the way they're examining governments and its interaction with people. I mean, arguably you're, you're being too careful, but I sort of like the impulse because the more I see people kind of knee jerk defending certain figures, you know, pundits or whatever, the more I'm like, I don't even want, you're making me not even want to defend people that I think are legit because it feels so not really using your brain, you know, right. They're on my team. So they did that for good reasons, surely. But there's always a couple of people. I guess uh, Kyle Geis, uh, the guy who wrote uh, Russia's War on Everything. Mm. Um, I, I, know. I know about that. His reporting's a little bit narrow in the sense that he focuses on Russia. Mm-hmm. But I, I absolutely love his perspective and his take. Um, if I had to be like, okay, I guess if I have to point to writers... See, that, that, like, it's exactly the problem. I grew up reading Richard Feynman's work and then come to discover he's a terrible human being who wrote really well. And it's like, uh, oh, things. I don't want to, like, the, the people who have good points about philosophy aren't necessarily the same people whose lives you want to even mimic. That's, yes, <laughs> that's true. That's a... Or people take some weird journeys, like coming from American libertarian land I'm I'm captivated by Murray Rothbard because he was like seven different dudes. <laughs> and when he started, he was pretty leftist and said some weirdly positive things about people. I wouldn't say positive things about like Mao. And then he ended his life in the nineties as the most horrendous paleo conservative, like and, and in the middle, he went, you know, like, I don't know, maybe I'm not uh branching out enough because i've never changed that much but uh you know you can catch somebody in the middle of their career and it's very different yeah i do hear that there is an entire concept in anarchy that i feel like people need to highlight more just kill your heroes oh yeah i i love (laughs) the idea and i hate don't have to love the person Mm mm-hmm we at least most of us need to go a lot more in that direction um to, surely i mean i like i love finding somebody in history who was legit like the more i've found out about frederick Douglass, the more i'm like damn like he he spoke at the seneca falls convention i didn't know that until like last year you know right or like someone like john brown where it's like no me and my family are going to fucking end this this is my morality and i am not just accepting something that is clearly evil according to my morality i'm fucking doing something about it yeah i totally i do get that i'll do (laughs) yeah yeah seriously yeah no i'm I'm gonna try to avoid a political um tangent that's always very tempting um but so you, you were you were touching on your reasons for um Rainbow Reload, and I guess a little on on, um, YouTube for education, but can you expand on kind of your hopes for your channel in particular? Like, what what are you doing there, and what do you want to be doing? Uh, So, at the moment, we are doing a lot of animation stuff, because there's a lot of concepts that I have... I can talk about it until the cows come home. Mm -hmm. But being able to show, like... uh, the last one we did was on animation and being able to, to give us or on, well, on ammunition, not on animation. Wow. That, it helps to be able to use the English language. Mm-hmm. The last episode that we had out was on how ammunition actually functions. And there's a bit about, have you ever heard of something called rimfire? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. So the weakest round you can buy in the U S right now, the cheapest round you can buy in bulk is called 22 long rifle. That's a rimfire cartridge, which means most cartridges have like a primer in the center in the back. Rimfire, there is priming compound put into the rim of the cartridge, and then the hammer will come down and pinch the rim. And that's what makes the, the primer go off. Okay. But the problem is you put you, they drop the primer in the center and then spin the case in order to get the primer coated evenly. Mm-hmm. But realistically, even that, like, you can, if it's weighted a bit weirdly, or even just, like, it happens to miss one spot on both sides, 
it won't necessarily, it's not miscoded because it did absolutely get spun through. There will just be a part where there's not priming compound. And because of that, there is a percentage of rimfire ammunition that just won't go off. Okay. That is one of those things that it is explaining that to people is both lengthy and the the number of times where I'll have people either not, not believe me or not understand, um, especially because 22 Magnum is one of the softest rounds that, in, depending on who you talk to, I, this is absolutely not fucking me. There are certain people who argue it is useful for home defense or self-defense. Mm -hmm. And my argument will always be some percentage of it will not go off. And the single loudest noise you will ever hear in a gunfight is a click when you expect it a bang. So like, yeah. no, this is not a good idea. Being able to, instead of just sit here and argue, have a video I can reference of like, no, you need to understand this is how it's made. And this is a problem that can happen is something that I wanted to have accessible for people. I wanted to make educational content accessible. Um, what I would like to do is do more competitive shooting. Mm -hmm. I, I am a decent shooter. I'm an, uh, I, like I said before, or like it said in the bio rather, I'm an I'm NRA certified as an instructor. When I go to USPSA matches, I am not, I am not nearly as competitive as I should be. I get like B and A instead of the master and grandmaster class. That was another acronym we're going to need to. Okay. So a USPSA is the U S pistol shooting association. I probably could have guessed that just by, but yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. So that's a, it's a hyper competitive. It's honestly the best place to learn and advance your skills. Okay. And, and I went to a competition as like a friendly thing uh, a couple weeks ago. And it was like a fresh reminder that I have, I, I am, I, I'm certified as an instructor. I have some skills, but I'm not nearly as fast as I should be. I'm not nearly as capable with the speedy stuff as I should be. So I want to spend a lot of time this year and next year uh, getting my competition spill, skills built up. Um, kind of, I've been doing a lot of things with a community defense mindset and with a focus on protective shooting, which means you always train with a timer, which has definitely helped. Oh, okay. But even there's certain skills I would like to, to, to narrow down and get like perfected and then maybe make content on like, this is the process to get there. I feel like I am a decent shooter, but I sit next to people who are much better than me. I mean, I can suddenly recognize I'm good enough to teach beginners. I'm good enough to get people their first shots and get people up to a place where they are comfortable shooting and know how to do so with some aggression and with some speed and with, you know, with follow-up shots that are quick and get on target. But once you start getting into like fine improvements, once you start getting into like, okay, how do I get that next half a second down? These are engagements where fractions of a second matter, but I'm still working on getting me to that point too. So I can't really effectively be teaching that. The, there's some of the, the ideas that I know that I need to like hammer down and get perfected. I also really fucking appreciate that my Discord constantly pushes me into doing this shit. So shout out to the Kuramura Discord. <laughs> so who do you picture that you're t like, um, the whole rim, was it rim fire? I've already... Yes. <laughs> That's already like, like, you know, I wouldn't click on that in the sense that I don't know what we're even talking about. Um, do you like imagine like trying to reach people who are already on their way with shooting? So that video was called How Do Bullets. <laughs> okay. That's... Buried in it is an explanation of that, is an animation of why some rimfire won't go off. <laughs> Um, no, sorry, that was in the sequel, Why Are Bullets? Okay. Um, which, again, I, I try and make it kind of accessible. So the kind of thing that somebody who is learning shooting will go, okay, I need to learn about this, and also that seems like my level. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a somewhat advanced concept, but also there are no beginner concepts when you're talking about the guns that defend your life. We are... If you get to that point, you need to just know everything. You need to have a well-rounded base of information as much information as you can get is useful. And the way I see my audience, the the person who will be like the max audience for me, the the you are exactly who I am aiming at, is somebody who is queer, who is interested in community defense, and is just getting started in guns. To me, you, the ultimate person is somebody who last year was talking about gun control and is just now realizing 
oh shit, that's a tool the cops use. That's not a way to actually help me. I think my goal is to help queer folk arm because our community is facing direct exponential lethal threats. And we're at the point in the bell curve where getting people online, the way I always say it is getting people dangerous to keep others safe. Like, even if there are cops there, they might not necessarily be there to help you. If there aren't cops there, we shouldn't be a soft target. Mm -hmm. And helping the community have spikes, have, helping the community have a, 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 a real response to lethal threats, that's my goal. Depressing follow-up question. Do you imagine that you're going to get more people who last year were gun control people and then... I guess that's me asking how pessimistic you are about the need for people to change their minds on that. Uh, the need is categorical. I would yeah. say a big problem with the queer community is the way that we have been sold a lie and abused mm -hmm. by uh, especially left political systems. The I, There has been for a long time. You had queer activists that would take up every democratic cause. Because you had people in the Democrat and the Democratic side who, to be fair, you had people on the GOP side is the way I should start that. You have people who are on the GOP's payroll, who are like car carrying, hard hitting Republicans that uh, do not get challenged by other Republicans saying queerness is evil, saying your existence is not just wrong, but you rape kids by existing like. The idea that queerness is inherently evil was also being pushed by the same people who were like, "You're you're you're evil. You're that they'll keep those terrible evil faggots away from the kids." Also, everybody should have guns. Yes. And when you have the people who are supposedly on the other side of the aisle from the ones calling you fucking evil, saying, "We see you. We are so sorry you're dealing with this." That is crushing and debilitating. You do not deserve that. Fight with us and we'll fight for you. That That's a really convincing argument to some, especially when you have someone telling you you're evil for existing. The, whatever else is packaged with it, the people who say, no, you're not, are going to be appealing. Sure, of course. So we've had a lot of queer activists who have thought the answer is just getting accepted publicly. The, once yeah. we get to a certain Overton window, it's not going to be a problem. Once we get public acceptance, then everything else isn't a problem. So just make queers the acceptable queer, because we have to shift the Overton window to accept us. Except queerness is inherently a thing that like gets hate, gets cops throwing shit our way. It gets that when that hate becomes legalized, that becomes hate from cops that like you can't separate you can't uh you can't have a system of people who are supposedly on the one hand fine with cops and have cops at boston pride and you know are, are just they're just like you for real but there is no acceptable queer the people who are pushing that we're evil aren't doing this in good faith not even the dullest most military joining married in a most religious way possible i mean there was this whole fight to become you know the right to be boring and mainstream right and it sort of it succeeded to a point i would say but those the, those people who are calling the more obviously queer people evil they're not going to stop it i mean you get a lot of you know, the queer Republican who's like, wait, you don't like me either? I thought that I was on your team and suddenly, you know, you're misgendering me. I can't. Right, exactly. The uh, when you have like the, the, the Republicans that are log, the, the log cabin Republican team that are all wondering why the leopards are suddenly eating their face. Indeed. I understand why people want to just be normal mm -hmm. and i don't want to sit here and pretend like if you're not the most outrageous out there of all time then you're clearly like you're you're not queer enough or whatever 
I think it's really telling that even places where like they get there was a, a place in the UK where they had a, a trans bathroom ban. Mm-hmm. Um and there was a trans woman who was forced into the men's room. And there was a bunch of people who were complaining. And then worse, there was a trans guy who, following the rules as required, he went into the women's room to use the bathroom. And there has been so much discourse and discussion and fighting from the same people who pushed to put him there that it is off-putting to them that he's in the bathroom. That, but I... I'm a, I'm a woman. Why is this man going in the bathroom with me? And it's like, yes, that shouldn't have happened. You shouldn't have fucking pushed for that. But also it's really telling that the problem that they have is not they want trans people into the sex of their assigned space. They don't want trans people to exist. If they don't follow the rules, they get yelled at. If they do follow the rules, they get yelled at. The whole point is just making trans people uncomfortable for using the bathroom. That normalcy push is frequently the most bad faith that you will ever see. Because you'll have a lot of conservatives that show up and are like, oh, you're the, I appreciate that you're one of the good ones. But they will not be there for any of your fights. They will actively refuse the idea that you deserve any stop from being hated on for your queerness. They are merely happy that you're signing off on the abuse. Mm-hmm. Maybe you'll last a little longer um, before they get to you, but that's probably all right. you're going to get. The last one on the pyre still burns. <laughs> oh man, that's so terrible. Uh, yeah, I'm, I was interested in, I guess I've also heard it, um, referred to by older and older gay men and some other people uh, the, the categorizes the difference between um like queer liberation versus queer rights and mm. a lo- and it initially there was a lot more liberation and then it turned into rights of course the 50s people in like america they had that totally not obvious name the something society I mean, it's liberation versus assimilation. I mean, I don't know why I want to push on this, just because I'm interested, but, like, I absolutely get and I love the the, the, the queer as inherently political and subversive thing, Mm. but there are boring, boring LGBT people out there who, I don't know, I mean... And aren't they valid in the sense that they believe something and that they think it's not tied to their... I mean, I don't know. I just find this... I think there's no, there's no such thing as an acceptable queer in the sense that there is no version of queer that the people who are pushing anti-queer laws and policies will actually accept. Yeah. Because every time the Overton window shifts, their acceptable line is whatever is behind that. The second it becomes more accepting, they push their Overton windows back. They They don't exist as a fixed point. They are not actually trying to argue this is where decency is. All they want is to remove acceptance. They only exist as a function of de- of restricting acceptability. If they were fighting for decency, they would have fixed points that they were like, this is the thing we're fighting for. Every time something gets accepted, then their response is just before that is where we would have accepted when gay marriage was the thing, the fight was, we're fine with you adopting, we just don't want you marrying. Before, when gay adoption was the thing, it was, why the hell are we letting these sodomites adopt children? But those same people who are calling gay people sodomites and saying that they don't deserve to have families, as soon as gay marriage becomes acceptable, we were fine with you having kids, we just don't, our problem is the word marriage. That's all we care about. Yeah. Because the goal is not prevent, is not protecting marriage. It's preventing progress. Mm-hmm. If we got to the point of gender being instantly flippable and uh, the government ha- deciding that poly relationships were okay, these same people are going to say, 
Look, we were fine with gay marriage. Well, gay marriage was fine with us. We're not hateful. We just want to have decency. Yeah. It does not matter where the line is. They move their point, which means they don't have one other than hating us. And they are always hankering to go back if necessary. Um, I... Hmm. So in one ContraPoints video... Um, which I think all cis people should watch her videos in some ways, because I feel like I learned some stuff. Um, she talks about conservative trans YouTuber Blair White, who talked to Ben Shapiro at one point, and Blair White was using the example of an adopted parent as, as an equivalent to, to being trans. So basically, unless you're at your doctor's office, the, you know, that it doesn't matter. Like, it's not, you know, like, no one goes around. If you're an adopted mother, no one says, you're not a real mother. Like, nice try. Biology is real. And the way it was explained in this video, I was like, my God, this is great. This, people who don't understand anything, that could work for them. And I was excited when I saw this. And then I kept seeing people doing like a faux, like there was Pete Buttigieg and his husband holding their new babies and being like, oh, where's the mother? I don't get it. And right. to me, it looked like a concrete going backwards. Like the dislike of surrogacy, the like, it's... It's control. It is straight up. There are people who have control of religious communities. And part of the way they have control of those communities is shame. They're able to convince people you the way you feel that's evil that's wrong that's the devil trying to get inside of you follow what i tell you and i'll give you the path to god everybody else is evil i've got the shit i'm the one who can get you to heaven but they don't have any answer other than hating queerness so they have to just keep pushing that in different flavors whatever can be pushed yeah i just um I'm accidentally optimistic, and then when I see things that look like a demonstrable backwards thing, it's... I hear you, but Blair White has me blocked, so... <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> not... <laughs> I mean, ContraPoints doesn't seem to love her, but, you know, that's what she was citing, and I yeah. thought that that simple thing... It's like, it would have worked on Ben Shapiro if Blair White hadn't kind of dialed it back. Like, if she'd kind of kept going, she... That's like, the she thing. Was... You're expecting Ben Shapiro to be here for an argument. You're expecting Ben Shapiro, because he pushes himself as the debate bro. He loves facts and logic. It's his favorite. Debate, to me, is evil. Like, I think conversations are great. I think conversations, I think trying to have discussions about things are incredibly important. Debate is when you harden down and refuse to adjust how you think. And debate culture has led to people wanting to be correct more than being right. It's led to people who, I don't think Ben Shapiro would have in any universe accepted what he would have viewed as a loss and uh, yeah. uh, acquiesced to her point. He would bend his mind and his logic to make himself right. Yeah. And because that is his entire personality, because that is his entire branding, I am the, the smart guy who is right. That Ignore all the times I get owned on social media and just focus on the fact that I am supposedly a, a very intelligent person because I can go to a college and I can outthink somebody who doesn't have media training. <laughs> A 19-year-old right. who never spoken in public in their life. But a 17-year-old kid who is <laughs> taking, who you are, one, badgering whenever they try and answer questions so that you can try and trip them up, and then focusing on the trip up rather than actually engaging with their points, who has no media literacy training, who you are expecting to, so to source arguments on their goddamn phone while you are actively lying about what the contents say. Like, it, he, Ben Shapiro isn't somebody who tries to have conversations. He debates. And that's the point where I'm like, debate is evil. Because I, I think conversations are incredibly fucking important. I think, hell, even heavy disagreements are incredibly important. A debate is a fight. It is not a disagreement. It is. Uh, do you know the the legal story about the first the first lawyers? Have you ever heard this parable? 
I don't believe so. The way we used to solve problems is, uh, I want this land. Somebody else says, well, I want that land. Okay, well, let's try and kill each other. And whoever dies, clearly God wasn't in their favor. So true. Exactly. Honestly, that's where uh, problem solving used to be. Uh, the fir- At some point, some rich fuck was like, I want that land. And some other rich fuck was like, I want that land. And they were like, I'm not going to kill you over this. I want that land, though. How about this? I'll hire a champion and you hire a champion. And those two champions will beat each other to the fucking death. And whoever wins, God is in their favor. Those two champions are the first lawyers. <laughs> and that's that's how I view debate. Because it's not about trying to get to the truth. If you are wrong in a debate, you do not acknowledge you were wrong. You do not adjust your positions and even maybe have a breakthrough of, yeah, this side maybe does not have the defense that we thought it did. You double the fuck down. You fight. It is combat. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong, there absolutely is some argument to be made that ideas need to be able to be defended. And people change. And, and people, people are absolutely. redemption stories. Hundred percent. I'm not. I, I don't want to say that there's no such thing as a redemption or our ability to come back. I do think that often people who focus on debates get so locked into how they assume it must be. Mm-hmm. You don't look for the truth. You look for evidence that confirms you're right. Yeah. You don't look for unbiased information. You look for stuff that confirms your bias. Yeah. Arguments are fine. Discussion and disagreement is necessary. I honestly think debate culture, debate culture and its influence has been terrible for human for for society. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I never, I don't, I don't, I'm not holding my breath about Ben Shapiro. I just right. found that a fascinating snapshot. Um, I think it just highlights to me the reason why I have such trouble. There is no such thing as an acceptable queer because the people you're fighting with are, they're debating. They're not actually here for decency. Yeah. They are here to win. And if they need to, they'll pretend like they were fine with gay marriage. If they need to, they will, they'll pretend like they were fine with everything right up until now to get you to agree to roll things back in the, in the name of progress. Yep. They like find their footing before they start pushing you back again. Yeah, and I take right. a moment, but it's kind of the the perfect example of this is uh, what's her name, um, Posey Parker, where she's said a couple times recently that she's not actually a feminist. She doesn't believe in feminist theory. She just kept calling herself a turf because they were agreeing with her. Because yeah, the idea of the turf rhetoric was never an agreement with feminism. There is nothing feminist about you are only a woman if you are if you have a womb and that is your only importance as a woman that is not fucking feminism no it's not and that's there's that's why you had people like parker posey who when they were talking about turf they're like i'm here to protect women women's rights and then when abortion comes up it's like fuck those tramps like literally pushing the idea that anybody who disagrees with you is therefore disagreeing with feminism is a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily need to be couched in reality. Same thing with like the acceptable queer of like, Oh, I I'm not homophobic. I'm not transphobic. I just want a normal queer. I want the normal trans people. And like, have you seen queer people like on their own? We are, we are queerness. To me, the the last video, one of the last videos I put out was called "Guns Are Gay," mm-hmm. and uh, I'm tr- specifically trying to make the argument that queerness isn't just a uh, a statement about sexuality; it is a reflection of human weirdness. It is okay. perfect example is there is a giant body of, of work as to whether or not disabled dating experiences are queer or not. I would argue they are. I would argue a lot of disabled people have the same kind of coming out experiences. They have a lot of the same kind of uh, isol- uh, isolating experiences. They have, they face a bunch of the same discrimination problems um, because there was an article that was written by uh, Nadia Cho who wrote uh, What is Queer? And her, this is her exact quote. Being queer is first and foremost a state of mind. It is a worldview characterized by acceptance through which one embraces and validates all the unique, 
uncontroversial ways that individuals express themselves. It is about acknowledging the infinite number of complex, fluid identities that exist outside of the limited, dualistic categories considered legitimate by society. And I, I, I think if we want to get to the point of actual acceptance, we have to stop, frankly, we have to stop talking to the people who say, oh, we'll accept people as long as you kick out the weird ones. Because their goal is not acceptance. Their goal is shifting your weirdness before negotiation starts. That's a fucking, that is a tactic to turn groups against themselves. Yeah. Like the LGB groups. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Who all they're going to get is the fucking Ernst Rome treatment. Yes. Like, this is not you saving your skin. This is you saving your skin until you're last on the pyre. The last one on the pyre still burns. And I think if we want to get to the point of true acceptance, the way we get there is not having people accept... I would love to, to, to say people aren't selfish. That you could get people to the idea of all of humanity is fucking weird. A lot of them are different than you. Just, just swallow it. I think... Everybody's weirdness is a reflection of you in a way. Because humanity, everybody is a piece of this wonderful complex thing. We need as many weird and wild and varied abilities to engage with the world, perspectives, ways of thinking. And when we have that, and we have your your thing isn't wrong, you're just that is one flavor. That there is suddenly a, we're all just fucking human rather than it's us and them. Mm -hmm. People think simplistically. I think giving them an other is a really simple way to, to break people up. It's the best. And the only way to beat that is to go even simpler. There is no other fuck that. It's a reflection of you. Yeah. After all that, I guess specifically... Are you optimistic or pessimistic both right now and in your life in terms of progress going in the right direction? I have the most stocked my bug out bag has ever been. How do I put this? I don't want to say I have pure pessimism because I, I, I always want to believe there is a chance of humanity cracking some major cultural event that pushes things one way or another and nobody can predict the future i am seeing a return to nazi rhetoric in a way that i haven't in a long like i haven't seen this kind of thing publicly a lot of the stuff that you will hear people screaming at the top of their fucking lungs is the kind of stuff you only used to hear here on like stormfront boards yeah. and like when you were doing alt research and trying to figure and like going into the exact worst corners of the internet. I unfortunately I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like I think positively about the future. Um, I'll say this: I am scared for a lot of the possibilities for what can happen. If you were to extend the future to, like, not the next two, three, four years, I feel like there are going to be horrors in the near future. But I also feel like we are, we are, living, we are living in exciting and important and eventful times, but I don't think it's going to end horribly. I have faith in the end of humanity, whatever the, the getting through to the other fucking side, whether or not I live through that is a giant fucking question mark. But I honestly legitimately think at the end of it with the way information spreads with the way there's a great, it was a line from a shit post on Tumblr that has become my fucking motto in these moments. You cannot kill me in a way that matters because our information and our knowledge, our ability to generate work that lasts fucking forever mm. yeah you kill me there's gonna be three people who are inspired by me and make a version of this but better tomorrow like i'm not special 
I am in a bit of a weird position, but not very. There's many other people who are like me who have the ideas behind this. I happen to have a weird overlap where I spent a few years doing like video graphics stuff so I can make this shit look pretty. But like, that's not. There are a lot of other people who are ready to fight just as fucking hard, if not harder. I don't think I'm special. I think I just happen to be the one that's loud. That is both true and requires a certain amount of ego death that we're all working on and probably doing very poorly. I know I am. I think I agree in in a general sense of being a shorter-term pessimist and a longer-term optimist. Um, One of the more concrete things that I think I've seen is that the Great Replacement thing Mm. has been fully successfully laundered from Stormfront to mainstream normal society. That's definitely true. Which is, I just, I feel like I watched the whole thing happen. Like, and there it is now. I mean, so Great Replacement Theory, I would definitely say that didn't come from there because that has been a thing since, like, that, that has been a thing since the 1930s. Well, that's, yeah, sure, you're, you're right, you're right. Um, and even earlier than that, technically. That's true, and it was more acceptable then, I guess. But there was a there was a moment there where, you know, your, your national politicians weren't bit just talking about it. Um, and if they were, they would get challenged on it, absolutely. And now we have, I don't know what it is, because you have sides that absolutely are not... They, they rant about the, like, they're not pro-Republican. If they make one minor gaffe, they'll be jumping on them for it. And don't get me wrong, it's hilarious when they do that shit. But, like, you're not talking about them repeating Nazi talking points. You're talking about them being old and senile. Like, they're, that's the fucking problem. The amount of hope that I have in Joe Biden is so horrifying. Yeah, because... I have none. I have zero. Uh, I mean, rather hope that he wins as opposed to because, because, you know, the man had 30 years of being mostly awful. I mean, there's still kids in cages at the border. There's still, I, however much I appreciate the, the Trump absolutely, absolutely will do worse things. He sounds worse now than he did in 2015. He's more crazy. He's more paranoid. I, one, my my bare minimum bar for uh, presidency is I'm not voting for a rapist for president. And That's a good standard. Unfortunately, that means both primary candidates are knocked out. So, like, I, I have never had faith in Joe Biden. No, I wouldn't advocate that for a second. I think the thing that pissed me off the most about the let's go Brandon thing is anarchists have been screaming fuck Joe Biden from the bottom of their lungs for a while and it felt like such a weak like a a beta move to be like oh we're we're sneaking it in no say fuck (laughs) Joe Biden with vigor you're right it is it's like eight-year-old stuff. I'm not going to say the naughty word. Like, ooh, we got it in because no, no one says this. No, we fucking say it from the bottom of our lungs. Grow a spine, dickbag. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, what I what I love about Joe Biden is that he doesn't have a cult following. No one liked him. Every one of my friends who voted for him did it so with great reluctance. And I tried to tell um, some relatives who are Bad he has a bit of a cult, not not, not nearly, nearly as bad, bad as Trump. As Trump. I, I wouldn't. A, of desperation, perhaps. Democracy <laughs> has you, American democracy and the American government has simps. I mean, that's true. That's definitely true. Biden is a big reflection of a lot of that, both from okay, the lengthy right? history involved with the system as a reflection of democracy working. Um, I think. Biden is not by any means the same level of the cult leader that Trump is. Um, Trump rallies make me wonder what's in the fucking Kool-Aid. Well, to be fair, those people were victims mostly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah Rally. but I mean, a lot of the people there, they, they knew the Kool-Aid had poison. That, 
they weren't, weren't tricked into drinking poison. They were tricked into believing an entire structure. They believed the cult leader. The cult leader was just wrong and an asshole. Biden, I feel like they've got to be slipping pep pills and, like, caffeine at the rallies just so that people aren't fucking passing out. Because, like, I agree. There's definitely not the same obsessive momentum. But I would say that Biden is, like, the figurehead for... Honestly, Trump is this radical blow up the system and replace it with something horrible. Biden is the two-party system is working. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think... I don't think anybody would sign off on either of those statements being good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, some people would, I guess. But. I don't think anybody who has a reasoned understanding of the entirety of the situation and a sense of decency would say that both of those are good options. Let me rephrase to that. You're absolutely right. I'm sure there are assholes who will agree with the worst takes borderline because they're the worst takes. Like, I get that. I mean, my whole education with Trump, at least um, not that I ever liked him in the slightest, but his whole thing made me remember just because it's not the classic institutional horrors it's like a little bit of a little bit of a flare on that like it's not mm. it, we, it didn't fix anything you know yeah, I hear that. scaring the american congress sounds neat except january 6 was a bunch of embarrassing awful people running around breaking shit and i didn't want them to you know right <laughs> it, it, it sounds really basic but it's like i still have people who don't understand that well, people are more mean now. They're more overtly unpleasant. Great. What an exciting lateral move. Right. You know? Like, unfortunately, I think there is a non-zero chance that there are huge parts of the country that will view Trump not winning as the sign to kick things off. I wonder. And that legitimately freaks me the fuck out. I, I do think there's a fair amount of fairly awful people who are lazy or self-interested or just who don't want to like kick it off but i mean obviously it doesn't have to be everybody or anything but you know there's there are even nazis probably who are like i'm i'm scared i don't want to i'll just stay here and be nazi all by myself the weird thing is that's the less terrible version to me because like I agree. I 100% agree. A bunch of demoralized, our guy didn't win people, half of them are not, are not going to show up. Uh, a bunch of them are going, the ones that will show up are frequently going to be ill prepared, ill trained. They're not going to have decent equipment. It's not going to be a, a, a real, like, that's not my. I feel like that would be a fight, but I would also say. Okay, so the army goes in and everybody else just, like, protect your communities and we'll mostly be fine. The one that freaks me the fuck out is the idea of Trump winning. Because however much I'd love to say I'm worried about Trump, I'm more worried about his supporters. Yeah. And I don't think for a variety of reasons that Trump would be dumb enough to let the police be involved with a lot of the like round potential rounding up. I do because the, the optics of it would be horrifying. Mm. I do think Trump will tell the police don't interfere with my political teams. And Trump supporting hateful dick bags will essentially have no resistance from the police while they terrorize and attack minority communities that they view as uh, others to kick out. Yeah. And that's the part where I'm like hardening my community against that, getting people ready for how this shit's going to break out because it's going to be horrifying. Yeah. There's something to that, I think. I'm truly, like, I, I don't want to go again, like, apparently today I pretend to be a Democrat or something, but like, <laughs> Even amongst the police, you're, you're going to have people who don't actually fully get down to, like, whatever atrocities are being recommended. But 
you know, you can't count on that, obviously. Uh, unfortunately, one, I do think there would be, if they tried to do it through the police, through traditional channels, there are enough people who believe they are doing good as an officer that would try and, like, uh, slow, complicate, and, like, create huge problems. Mm -hmm. I would also say, unfortunately, it would be better from their perspective if they didn't have to deal with police rules, if they could create their own structure to begin with. Yeah. Um, there is a reason why there were the German police and then there was the SS units. And those didn't start as military units. They started as uh, a political arm or as a, the security arm of the Nazi of the, 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 the Nazi political machine. That's the part that I'm concerned about. Because yeah. police are better and worse. They have really shit camera setups, but at bare minimum, there's there there is a lot of people who are paying attention to them. There's I don't want to sit here and pretend like cops are a, a decent answer for a lot of things, but at bare minimum I can I can get why you would think there might be if Trump were to push it through the police, it would be as horrifying as it could be. I, I do agree there. I think the, the scary version is Trump tells national and local police forces, you are not to interfere with my political security team. That is easier for people to to swallow. Right, and then it's not even the police doing it. The, poli uh, the police aren't rounding people up. The police would never round people up. Those are that's a political thing. That that they're lying to you. It's fake news. The cops aren't co rounding anyone up. There's political activists that are engaging uh, undesirables, but that's that's a separate political issue. That's not the police, even though the police will never prevent the deaths and assaults. I mean. Of course, we still have a whole ass border patrol and other things, and we are also back to the idea of oh, deporting all, you know, 12 million um, illegal immigrants from America. I hate that. And language. I say illegal immigrant yeah. because that's not a pejorative in my book. Oh, I, I, just, I, I hate that language. I, I would, I would, because no human being is illegal, and perhaps more importantly, we are violating international law by creating laws for how they enter the country that prevent them from just entering and applying for asylum. We have signed international treaties that promise anybody who needs to can enter for asylum and request asylum. You cannot ask for asylum from outside of the country. And just basic decency says that if somebody requests asylum, you have to actually process it. We're not actually processing most of the asylum requests. We're locking kids up in cages. Uh, ICE, to me is their own horrifying military unit that needs Absolutely. massive restructuring. And if you ever needed proof Biden is not the fucking good guy, Biden agrees with Trump's policies. They're threatening to kick off even more, you know, concrete focused stuff of like just... And that's the thing. I don't, like, we have concentration camps being run by Biden. And I'm sitting here being told the other Nazi that will make concentration camps for you is worse. And, like, they're both fucking bad, but I feel selfish pretending like the one that's coming after me is inherently worse than the one that is actively coming after others. Well, I guess the argument only is that they're both going to go after the other guy and maybe one is going to go after you and the other guy. I, I, I mean, I'm not, I'm never, I'm, I would never vote for Joe Biden. I, nah, I get that. And w prepare yourself to be blamed for, personally blamed if Donald Trump wins. One of the advantages of living in New Hampshire is I am like 75, 80%. Sh I should not say that. You know what? I wanted, last time, uh, Trump did not win New Hampshire. And I am really fucking hopeful that will repeat itself. Yeah. Um, so, no, the fact that I did not vote for... Uh, I, I refuse to... No, I voted for Clinton. I, I, put, I pinched my nose and voted for Clinton. 2020, I did not vote for president. 2020, fuck you, these are two terrible options. I will not vote for a rapist. This should not be a disqualifying line, and yet here we are. 
2020, there was a lot of local elections that I gave a fuck about. I left the president blank. Um, as well, as we, as we all should. <laughs> That's the dream. Like, there's... I, anybody who says that they don't vote and it's just the end of that sentence, I guarantee you there's a bunch of local shit that you'll care about. Um, mm-hmm. The Down the road, the fucking schools getting a, a new uh, music program and gym, like, built into one thing, and fuck yeah, cool. Like... That, that, that's good. You want to vote so that lo- your, the kids in your area get shit, so that services continue functioning the way that you want. I've never been as good at paying attention to local stuff as I should be, so I know that a lot of people that doesn't do that. I'd love to sit here and be like, oh yeah, I'm constantly paying attention to it. I will, like, two days before the election, I will go through the issues and be like, do I care about that? No. Two days? That's pretty good. I'm on the way to the polls. <laughs> I mean, I, my thing is I want, I'm a, a geek that needs, like, I need to do some Googling. So if I'm going to be looking up something, I want to have my computer in front of me. But, like, yeah, like the day before, like, checking it, like, just good. Especially uh, around here, they're really good about sending out detailed ballots, not just, like, this is the stuff you're voting on, but it'll be like, here's the thing. Here's a paragraph from each side explaining their case. Wow. Yeah. That's not at all. Oh, we don't we don't got that at all. Uh, Manchester's vote, uh, the voter registry system up here, the people who run it are fucking on point. Um, yeah, the issues will have like, they'll be like, this is the law, and here's a paragraph that we have all agreed, this is what the law is trying to say in non-legalese English. Whoa, we get the classic, if it's a ballot initiative, it's trying to make sure the average person doesn't understand. You know, it's fully, the wording is just the legal. I have to read it five times. Somebody who is not an English language person, that's the only thing I can do. Uh, they're, I mean, it's, they're, they don't want you to know. It's not for you to understand. Manchester has a really clever system where instead of everybody agreeing on the language, um, Parties that have over a certain vote count get to have their representation of the initiative. Oh. So if there's like a Dem issue, the Republicans will have a response that's like, this is a waste of money, this is... But the Republicans get to determine their response. The Democrats get to determine a paragraph of this is what we are saying the law does. Um, both paragraphs, you're not allowed to... I think the wording is like, you're not allowed to... Uh, deliberately misconstrue the law so there will be like going back and forth as does this mean that but if it's even close it gets accepted after sort of the, what the free state project turned into i got oh, it i was like oh new hampshire i guess isn't the the beacon it was supposed to be uh because you know disappointment the free state project it burst christopher cantwell the crying nazi and other gems seriously the especially like we're here for freedom which is why we are going to ban you from giving your kids certain medical options because we're here for freedom not yours but we're here for a freedom i think i mean if you can you can hit your kids but you can't you know sit down with an expert who talks things out and just no no can't do that things we kind of hit like no, you know, I feel like you answered the question of whether you're for a, guns is, a, you know, a practical uh, equalizing thing versus an abstract right, but like... So, I actually do have something to expand on there, because okay. 100% I think most people that can, gigantic fucking asterisk over that, that can, should try to carry for defensive purposes. You are protecting yourself and your community. That asterisk is because huge numbers of people can't. Mm -hmm. And I think we also need to make space as a community for the fact that for the fight that's coming, there are multiple roles. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different jobs. You do not have to be the one shooting. We need just as many people being medics. We need people who are advocates, who are specifically not armed and just dressed in a nice fucking suit. We need people who are feeding others. Like, there's so many different pieces of what a community needs. And guns, I am a massive firearms nerd. I absolutely adore the concept and the violent clockwork, and I totally get why there is a 
a feeling of uh, an equalized capability that you don't have otherwise. Me walking down the street, I'm not unmuscular but like that's that's certainly not a lot of muscle my ability to, to fight one person is a possibility it's going to be a, sl- a struggle but I, I can get my way through a fight or two if i'm dealing with a larger group there is no fucking option for me other than a gun if there is a group that is coming to cause me lethal harm i my choices are i respond with a, a an equalizing force like a gun or I run the fuck away. Yeah, they, people want you to run away, I guess. If right. You're... And especially if you're talking about, like, someone on their own, if it's just me, I, I run the fuck away. If it's me and another person, and I'm not sure that person can run away, that might not be a fucking option. Especially when you're talking about if we want to have a community, we want to have a culture and events, we need to have people that can defend that when people come and try and shut you down, you can stand firm and say, I'm, I'm your security for the event. I don't know what you're talking about, but you're not fucking hurting anyone today. And that is needed, but at the same time, it is absolutely worth mentioning that if you can't carry a gun, please, please do not feel like this makes you lesser. Please do not feel like this means you're not needed in any sort of fight or community protection there are a lot of different things that are needed a lot of different roles and it's important to highlight we are not saying the only way to fight is with a gun i i have to ask about your nra certification because yeah i hate the nra yeah and i believe in fewer restrictions than the nra does technically Um, the nra is the only use or at the time it was the only really useful certification that i could get okay i was looking at there's a couple different places honestly having talked to a number of people nra certification is good enough for like basic shit honestly it was good enough for me teaching beginners um i want to get my uspsa certification that is far more fucking meaningful i'm also an okay shooter by that perspective and i fucking smoke most of the when i go to like nra group days and like uh any of the if i'm ever teaching a lesson with like teaching another nra instructor i can probably teach you some shit if you're a uspsa instructor you're teaching me some shit uh and you can both teach me shit because like i know enough about uh a def- especially about like uh defensive shooting and like specific forms of shooting that i can get somebody up to speed but if i want to improve myself it's not going to be through further nra classes i have already gotten up towards the 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 top of what they offer for instructors and it's not that advanced it's useful if you want to be an instructor there's good safety shit makes it mixed in with it there's a bunch of like things to think about that your students might do accidentally that if you didn't do this you might not realize the thing your students might do kind of thing but I would say the real skills are not from there. It's from, like, USPSA. It's from competition. Yeah, I never uh, liked them a lot, but I refuse to... After the uh, the killing of Philando Castile, um, mm. I don't know if you remember that yeah. fun police murder, and the NRA's reaction slash... Like, borderline non-reaction slash slight... Um, excusing by being like well there was like weed ash in the fucking right. um cup holder so you know shooting a legal gun owner who was lo- like loved in his community and who was sitting near like a three-year-old you know well and like the NRA is racist and it's really like i can fucking pr- prove it <laughs> with it like it's 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 there <laughs> under wayne lapierre's direction they got worse they got they went from uh, I'm not surprised if that's true. Yeah. They went from like a shit lib of, like the old NRA flat out was for gun control. Yeah. A lot of the early measures that were signed by Reagan Reagan were sponsored by the NRA. But Reagan was the the Black Panthers thing, right? Something he was like, Oh my god, I love gun control. Right. Look at the Black Panthers. Because uh if you need proof that the California assault weapons ban was specifically to target the Black Panthers with racial hatred, 
um, the M1 carbine was banned because they were picture taking defending other communities using M1 carbines. The M1 Grand with the bigger bullet that does far more damage, that shoots way faster, way farther, and with way more force, that's not banned. That's fine. But the carbine, the one that you would actually want for community defense, is banned explicitly. That's disturbingly blatant. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I, I didn't know. Um, one of the most famous pictures of Malcolm X, the one where he's holding a gun and looking out the window in the hotel. Yeah, because this, this poster you will find on, like, a bunch of uh, revolutionary folk will have this on their wall. Uh, it's, it's one of the more famous pictures of Malcolm X, and it's a picture of him holding an M1 carbine and looking out the window. Uh, a year after that photo went public, the California Assault Weapons Ban banned that weapon by name. Huh. What an interesting coincidence. And I, um, I believe Martin Luther King was denied a gun permit a couple yes. times. Um, yeah. <sighs> there are so many reasons we can't do the gun control. But I would love you to address the imagined person, which I freely admit is I have many friends like this who are just they're, they're LGBTQ, very in favor, um, don't love Joe Biden, probably pro Palestinian, like like. But somebody who looks at yet another shooting and is like, oh my god, this is ridiculous, and they want the gun control. Like, what do you say to people like that? In the United States. If you want to do a mass shooting, you have to buy armor, you have to buy a rifle, you have to buy a fair amount of supplies because most of our the places that you could attack are hard targets. It doesn't matter if it's just random people. This is America. Folks got guns. The idea that, one, if we reduce the amount of firearms in an era where I can 3D print an effective 9mm pistol caliber carbine, the only people who are going to have guns are the people who want to, who don't mind breaking those laws. Stacked on top of that, I would rather folks show up with ARs than drop bombs. In the event that we remove all of the guns but don't fix the actual source of why we have so much uh, like mass violence in this country, the violence will get worse. Yeah. Guns are sexy because they are dramatic, because they, they, uh, they're they cinematic. They are moments of exaggerated action. I don't want the easy option for somebody who hates their school to be following one of the many tutorials you can find online for how to build a large bomb. To be fair, those Columbine kids totally failed. Those Columbine kids brought a fucking bomb with them. I know, but they were they they all fail as far as I know. Right, but think about this: the Columbine incident would have been about two hundred times worse if they had the bomb if the bombs had actually gone off in terms of the victim count. Yeah, or, sorry, not two hundred, but like 20, fifteen to twenty times worse given the number of people who survived versus the intended damage of those bombs. We would have been talking about, uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, it's like 40 or 50 people died in Columbine, and we would be talking about like six, seven, eight hundred people dying if they had brought bombs and just blown up the building where everybody was in the assembly. Not to um, be overly pedantic, but it was only 15 people, including the killers, I believe. Okay. Um, and at, at the time, it seemed like such a big number, and then we had so many more. It, and that, honestly, that makes the... I didn't have the fucking numbers in front of me, but like, yeah, if they had bombed and blown up 500 people, that would have been 20, 30 times worse than the... the don't get me wrong, I'm not sitting here pretending like Columbine was not fucking horrifying. It was a tragedy that destroyed many lives. It was... With Horrible. bonus cop utter failure, of course, if you want me to Right. Say. But also, that, the idea that we should all disarm and trust the cops to protect us is also one of those things that, that is like a central tenet of gun control and why I don't understand how the people who are like, all co- ACAB, 1312, fuck cops, except the ones that I want to go around and disarm everybody else. And the cops that I want to be my personal armed security force. 
yeah. I, I mean, mean how, how are we doing, doing it? it? Like, like how, okay, we're gonna we're gonna get we're gonna ban all the guns. How how are we doing it? What is the contingency for people who refuse? I tried to ask fucking pro life people the same thing. Okay, you feel very strongly about the, like how are we doing this? How many restrictions on women, etc. Before they're even pregnant, do you want? Because you can't. Right. It can't be done. Let me ask a different way. If you are pushing gun control, and you are also pushing all cops are bastards as a concept, the the contradiction that I think most people bump into is the fact that every single piece of gun control that gets positioned and pushed as an idea exempts the police and the military forces. Somebody who genuinely believes fewer guns means safer communities if you truly believe that, if you genuinely, truly believe we get rid of the guns and we have a safer culture, get rid of the guns, no exemptions. Because otherwise, it's like they're your own private police force and you're offended that other people don't have to help carry their guns. Um, <laughs> weapons of war don't belong on our street. I always hate. It's like, yeah, they belong on fucking, you know, Fallujah streets or whatever. Not our streets. Every gun is a weapon of war. There is no such thing as a firearm that was not developed for war. That's every single gun was... And even then... Guns designed for war does not mean they were designed for, like, maiming. It means they were designed for effectively ending a threat. That's what I want. People who talk about not wanting weapons of war, I'm always hesitant to listen to them when they talk about any other sort of defense stuff because you're they're kind of giving the game away. It's an abstract to them. If your life, or more importantly, if the life of someone that you love is on the line, I don't want a fair fight. Fuck your fair fight. I want every unfair advantage. The idea that a weapon of war is bad because it means you have too much destructive capabilities, good. Give me that. That's what I want to defend my community with. I don't want to be sitting here hoping that if I have, if I, like, in the event of uh, a fight, you just run away because my bullets are not going to stop you in time. That's not what I fucking want. I want something that stops the threat. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible for me to disagree there. Um... I have a friend who, shout out to her if she listens to this because it's actually possible she might, who seems to have gone less and less keen on gun control as soon as she started working as a public defender. Mm. And she saw how many, usually black men, and the, you know, how screwed over they are, how much extra punishment you try to slap on when you have gun stuff. Um, it's, it's, an, it's an underrated, at, like, bonus for like war on drugs stuff you know you're carrying a gun and you sold some drugs and suddenly the mere presence of the gun yeah. can add appalling numbers gun control is a tool for cops that's all it is it's another tool for cops to use to target minority communities you, you cannot get rid of the prison industrial complex with that with and, and have gun control like you have to pick one and most cops aren't going to disarm their friends they're not going to go and find the people like who are either cops and go home take the badge off and put the hood on or cops where your friend you go home and call your friends with the hoods and tell them the info yeah. Neither of those groups are getting disarmed the people who get disarmed are the people who are activists the people the cops don't like that's the only people who are going to be targeted by these laws. Because laws are only as useful as your law enforcement. And if the people enforcing your laws are hateful fucks, it does not matter if you try and limit who has guns. Only the people the police approve about have guns now, and that's a fucking that's that's not a good thing. No. If you had um I don't know if you need magical powers in this scenario, but like what's wrong with America and, and all of our well, one of my main arguments, like, I agree on all of the, the self-defense stuff, but also there's a simple fact that America has too many guns to ban. Australia had, like, 30 million people, and I forget how many guns when they basically banned them in the 90s, I believe. They did, but Australia's also a really interesting hate counterpoint, because... Their hate crime has been significantly on the rise, even when they don't have the bodies of uh, religious hatred that we do. We're the ones who export it. They have more hate crimes than we do. The UK has more hate crime than the US. I did not misspeak there. That's not per capita. The UK has more hate crime against queer populations than the US. 
because, because we, we don't, don't have acid attacks, attacks in the U.S. US. Like, like, like I was saying before, if you want to attack queer communities or if you want to like, like uh, be a mass, mass shooter, you need to buy armor, you need multiple magazines, you need to be trained enough to, for what to do if your gun fails, because normally when your gun fails, that's when everyone starts shooting at you. Our communities are not soft targets. We, I, I am desperately doing as much as I can to try and shore up our defenses, but we are in a much better position to do that shoring than places where they've already banned guns because there is no ability for communities that the police regularly arrest or spit on to have any form of protection against lethal threats if it's not internal. You touched on 3D printing. Um, I guess, are you, like, do you have opti optimism about the future of guns with that kind of thing? I'm thinking about, like, all of the touted stuff. We, talk, we talked about Bitcoin before. <laughs> and the, it's many problems, but just um, getting around the state with various technologies. Um, I don't know. Do you, have, do you have hopes for what that could do for all of us? I, I, I guess... guess Starting with the last question, the single problem, uh, I'm going to turn back into a shitlib for a half second and quote right. um, Sam from the West Wing. <laughs> wow, West Wing. I'm never ready for that. Education is the silver bullet. If you want to fix every other problem, you fix it with education. Yeah. I think the problem is, is there are a lot of people, the reason why there's so many people screaming, don't teach my kids about queer shit, is they want to teach hate, and they know if they learn about queer people in school, they'll treat them like humans. The idea is so patently clear. Every time we have decent education, things advance. Every time we attack education, society gets worse. So I think the simplistic answer is awesome education on every level. And also, we need to start having continued education culturally for adults in America. That needs to be a more common thing. Yeah, I don't know what that might look like. I'm sure there's some subjectivity in there, but I'm um, also a fan of the concept of a non-coercive mental health system. Mm, yeah, that would make uh, it, that would make it less of a total disincentive to seek help if you have if you're leaning in a bad way. Um, a hundred percent. I know a lot of shooters who have either talked to me on a personal level, or um, this is a, an incentive that I, I push around every now and again. And I need. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go share it again now because every time I think about it, I go share it. If anybody in the shooting space is ever having a problem, um, I have a thing that I have done for many a friend, and friends have done for me, where you will take in either firearms or just a firing pin or whatever you need to not be okay because the number of people who i talked to who were like i would love to go get therapy but if i talk to people they're going to take away like tens of thousands of dollars of equipment and things that i use on a daily basis let alone like especially if i talk to somebody who's an instructor and then when i talk about mental health the conversation dries right the fuck up because they're talking not only about their the thing they focus on on a day-to-day -day basis it's their job like how like yeah, how, how do you pay for the mental health, health system that is taking your tools away if they take your tools away? They can take your tools. They can you know throw you in. Take you. I mean, there's all sorts of things. There, I 100% I agree, agree that a, a, a non-coercive mental health system would lead to wildly better outcomes in a lot of places. Yeah. All the people that we don't even like to think about with all the urges, even not. I mean, suicide obviously is made much easier with guns. Just it's yeah, it's a tool. It's also <laughs> worth noting though that suicide as a, a thing that's easy with guns. I think the only way you can get past that is when somebody who looks at their guns and is having that moment has a safe way to temporarily get rid of them. Yeah. And this, you know, the red, what is it, red flag laws, that's not going to do it. Not only is that not going to do it, it hyper encourages, it hyper discourages people from seeking help. Because if you're worried about the possibility of somebody taking away your guns, you're not going to be honest about your mental health state. I'm not surprised anyone is with the amount of disincentives to seek help that exists. Right. I, mean, um, it, I, I think 
One, One, I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. That would help a lot of people who, even outside of a gun space, just not wanting to feel like you don't have an option to leave if you say the wrong words. Mm-hmm. I, I, I told like having a non-coercive mental health system would absolutely be useful, which means it needs to be not police based. Yeah, I think it's really important that people make abundantly clear to anybody who has guns in their life that if you are ever have, if they ever have like a mental health struggle, if they're ever not dealing well with the world. If, if you, you can, can offer to hold, to hold stuff, stuff for them temporarily. Yeah, that's a good, that's really good. I haven't thought about, like, the concept of just, you know, that as a community helping each other type of thing, but sure. Yeah. Honestly, it's the only way to make that work, because yeah. if you're worried about the police taking them, you're not going to tell anyone. If, you're, if you know your friend will give them back when you are better, you can feel bad about not, you can feel better about not being okay now. It doesn't, it doesn't feel, feel like, like it's blowing, blowing up your life. That's why they're your friends, and the cops are not so much. Cops are specifically not, not your friends. <laughs> not even cool. I was, I was gonna, gonna. This is we got. We don't really have time, time to talk about mutualism, but I have seen you use that word. Yeah, yeah I've, 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 I've kind of flopped back and forth between uh, mutualism and systemic anarchy, anarchy as a descriptor. Okay. Systemic, systemic anarchy is where I've blended. Which I didn't really know that term until you. What I made up. <laughs> so, so ready to believe that was just yet another lie. There are so many flavors of anarchy; it's not even funny. And honestly, that was part of the problem because, like, I mutualism is like kind of a softer anarchy in some places. It's the idea of like you focus on mutually developed uh, relationships and trying to help your community rather than like believing the government is the answer. Systemic anarchy to me is a recognition that, on the one hand, governments are corrupting. Every government system is bad. But the flip side of that is systems are the corrupting force, not the government itself. And importantly, no system is a system, and it's arguably the worst one. It's might makes right. The idea of a government only makes sense in as much as it resists the worst parts of what systems can do. The allowing for something that topples might makes right is why we have a government at all. And it's the idea that rather than thinking of governments as a thing that you have to like hard fight and smash, it's you should build systems that make it irrelevant. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a tall order, but it's, it's oh, yeah. both better and more, more feasible, honestly, I think. It, you know? it is absolutely a taller goal. I would, I would also say it's the what that is the goal that builds the the systems that help the most people because yeah. it, it's trying entirely to focus on how you add to the community good. I used to be very much on the like I don't want to say hard revolutionary side, but I honestly thought for a long time there was going to need to be some kind of like smash the system, man, and then slowly realizing that like. The people who are most in need of protection are the ones who are going to be fucking horrifyingly destroyed by any kind of violent revolution. Inherently makes that revolution at best problematic and arguably like something that it's to be avoided at all fucking costs. Because the negatives are so bad, there's no way to balance them. That's actually, to me, is a huge problem. For me, is the what I would naivete of revolution. Let's do it tomorrow. And and to me, um, the French Revolution. Obviously, there's the most justified revolution you've ever heard of, including the one in Haiti, which I'm not going to like say was bad. But there were a lot of atrocities that came up with that too. Right. So blithely saying let's fucking do it, I think, is absurd because we know what happens every time, even if the cause is. Unimpeachably good. Like the, the French, French Revolution ended with, with a number of noble and capable thinkers getting the fucking guillotine because they didn't line up behind Robespierre. So the idea of like a revolution should skate. Like even people that who would have been viewed as like radical anarchists of their day were considered like fair game in the 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 worship of the guillotine and. That's why I hate the, the guillotine references. They're not helicopter jokes, but they're in the same realm of... Yeah, helicopter jokes are worse, but I do hear what you're saying. So we'd like to ask people, how would I get the Capitol Building to the Capuccino in your political utopia? 
you go, go into, into the store, store and buy it. it. Yes. <laughs> as, as far as, as I am concerned, my systemic anarchy comes down to governments are a thing to be resisted. I don't think in, an involvement with the government will ruin you. I think that still means we're going to have, have economic systems. systems. We're still going to have government systems. We're not going to shift to uh, we're going to snap our fingers and then snap the, the government out of existence. Mm. I do think the way to make society more equitable is to make communities stronger and government less needed. Yeah. I don't think we can get to the point of ever not needing them. Just the fucking currency. You're asking about how do I go into a store. I do not think there is a universe where getting rid of the dollar is a good thing. And that's tied into the American government. Like, there is no one without the other. So You don't want your gold or your other exciting, your free banking? I do not want to take my free oxen into Starbucks and try and negotiate. Uh, like, I am absolutely willing to... to, to dream of better i don't think different is inherently better mm. so, so my my dream systems are not blowing up the u.s government okay i think reducing the need for groups like the atf for groups like the fbi for groups like hell i think if we could have better state level environmental regulations the, the EPA wouldn't be as needed. The problem is just we have a lot of places where the states are so wildly corrupted that you need a bigger state to tell them, no, that's not how that fucking works. Right. This is the, this is the problem. Right. right. This is this is the well. I thought this was calling the 101st Airborne to desegregate um, Little Rock until I recently found out that. The mayor of Little Rock actually called the feds in the first place. Yeah. So if you're talking about then local, that's the ultimate localism. They would. They just called their big brother to come. In. Seriously. Um, <laughs> Which, Which is why it's always such a fascinating, fascinating point where people are like, like "Oh, that was the, the I, I wasn't about desegregation. It was the federal government that was the problem." The mayor of the town called in the military to make sure that this, their civilians wouldn't fucking be murdered by your acceptance of their desegregation. Like, yeah, I'm hitting a lot of horrible, like, states' rights as a concept, and it's ridiculous. But you're talking about localism and stronger communities, right? And there might be a point where you get into some ambiguity, but we've never been even close. I think. My politics are this. Your impacts will be best felt by your local community. The more you put into your local community, the better your world around you will be. The more you deviate away from that and start putting power into national and international governments, the less effective you will be at helping where you will have the biggest impact. I don't think there's a universe where we can turn off the, the larger Fed. And I don't think there's a universe where... Even if we could, that would have good outcomes. I think that everybody can acknowledge the Fed does some fucked up shit and we should have firm controls on it. I mean, the idea that we have some obligation to, like, well, Obama, you know, used an executive order to try to protect certain immigrants, and FDR used one to intern the Japanese, so the problem is executive orders. Like, well, executive orders are a, a small part of the problem. But, but am I supposed, supposed to be obligated, obligated to have some, you know, principled stance against protecting people from deportation because the same tool was used? It's very right. <laughs> I would, I would say, say the point is being missed there, especially when you're talking to somebody who brings up two flagrant extreme examples, and like there have absolutely been executive actions throughout the history of the presidency that. Like, like your funding, funding for the Manhattan Project was done through through an executive order. The Emancipation Proclamation was an executive order. Desegregating the creation of the Peace Corps itself was an, was an executive order. There are so many different things. Like I think we could talk about reining in the the impacts of certain groups. I don't think the answer is ever going to be. Either a full disassembly or a revolution that changes everything. Okay. The best futures that we can imagine are ones of God. The best futures we can have are incremental. 
Yeah. And I don't think there's a universe where we have a massive revolution and at the end of it, everything is perfect and better. I think there are a lot of things we need to focus on improving rather than blowing things up and starting over as a child's response. It's the, it's the flipping of the board game over because you didn't win. Quick, tell the people where they can find you on the internet. All of my content, the educational stuff is on YouTube, youtube.com slash Um If you, if you want, want to get access to that early, or if you want to support my channel existing, I have a Patreon, patreon.com slash QueerArmor. I'm on Twitter, although I am actively trying to be there less because it is terrifyingly bad for my mental health. <laughs> so <laughs> say we all. Queer Armor on there. I'm also the same thing on Blue Sky. I'm on Facebook. Uh, if you're in the New Hampshire area, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, Rainbow Reload is on Facebook. We do most of our group organizing through Discord, but all of the events are posted to Facebook. So especially the beginner ones that uh, we have, we ask everybody to go to one of our beginner events first. We have more woods-oriented days where we basically just go out in the woods as a group. We, we don't, don't really want to do that, that with new people, people for what I feel are obvious reasons. reasons that I, don't. I think most new people, the idea of like, come out in the woods with a bunch, bunch of random strangers and some guns. Yeah. It's not creepy, we swear. <laughs> but we have to get a that we post on Facebook. Those are usually like at indoor ranges. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, and we try to make them as accessible as we can. Yeah, that's awesome. I would, I'd, I'd show up if I could. I not that far. Come on up. <laughs> You're listening to the Non-Serbian Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, why not subscribe over on our YouTube channel or on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow us across social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Mastodon. If you're extra interested in seeing this project continue, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com. But if you can't contribute financially, we still like you a whole lot. And you can help us out just by liking and sharing this episode or any other one that catches your fancy. As always, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project alive. Thanks so much.